I want people to understand what the difference is between a phase one, a phase two, a phase mm -hmm. three study. Also understand what's preclinical. Um, it's not intuitive to people why mm -hmm. it costs a billion dollars to get a drug to market and why it can take a decade. Um, and then within that, if you could just embed enough of the details about decisions that you can make that will make or break you, yep. right? You, yep. How many times has a drug failed because the experimental design, the wrong patient selection, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. wrong disease selection? Yep. You, it is, you have got to line up four pieces of Swiss cheese just right to get the pen through to hit it. So let's... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but let's no, go no, no, back no, to you got Judah Folkman talking about VEGF, VEGF, yeah. VEGF that then turns into, well, if we made an antibody to VEGF, okay, so there's your idea. Now yeah. start the clock and start the dollars. If you start with a target, mm. often in oncology today, we'll start with a target. There's two things you have to to start with. One is what's the best way to turn down or turn off that target. Is it a small molecule? Is it an antibody? Um, Tell folks the difference. How do you think of small molecule versus antibody? Where do we draw the line? So here's a really simple way I think of that helps me. Small molecule is chemistry. Small molecule is, it can be, not always, a pill. Uh, um, a small molecule, you're, you're impacting on often pathways or enzymes or things that happen in the cell. Um, a large molecule, whether it's a protein or especially an antibody, an antibody is biology. An antibody, you're trying to do something that may be immune in nature, or you use the antibody as a delivery device. You're getting something to the cell. Um, it's a company like Genentech um, and many modern companies really like antibodies. I like antibodies because when something happens, it's on target. It, it doesn't tend to be off target. Small molecules, that chemistry tends to have surprises in negative ways off target, like liver toxicity yeah, so or this is, kidney it, toxicity. It, it, this is the way I, I do this through cardiovascular medicine to uh -huh. explain to people the difference between a statin and a PCSK9 inhibitor. You have these two very common drugs that are used to lower cholesterol, yeah. but a statin is a small molecule. And I don't say this in an insulting way, but we mm -hmm. use the terminology, it's dirty. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it does block an enzyme, but it's got all these off target of things yeah. and your liver function gets whacked. You get insulin resistance. Some mm -hmm. people get horrible muscle soreness. Right. So five to 10 percent of people taking this drug are going to have a side effect that prevents them from taking the drug. Right. Right. I've never seen a person yet who couldn't tolerate a PCSK9 inhibitor where you it's inject precise. an yeah. antibody into them that binds to a protein mm -hmm. and shuts it off. That's that, that's really a good example, and that 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 the choice of molecule is driven by that. When I was first in product development, there was this thing of oh, you need a pill, especially for chronic indications. You need a pill um, for um, compliance. Right? Who would take an injection for cardiovascular for, for cholesterol? Look at obesity drugs. Turns out a, a lot, lot of people <laughs> would take an injection if they want to. But once you have your your selection, you you need to make sure you can make it. Yep. And one of the critical things for a biotech company, if it's a protein or or an antibody, is the small scale production of it in small, they call it a mini firm. Uh, the mini firm has to resemble what is actually going to be used because the next thing you start doing is a bunch of models. Judah Folkman giving a great talk doesn't mean you believe that blocking VEGF will help cancer. So we do models in mice. We may do larger animals. Um, we do fewer animal models than we used to because they're really limited. Um, I would rather have a great target with good biology than an animal model, but it's still helpful. Yep. It's still helpful. And then the the critical thing is the preclinical work that you do what FDA is going to want to ask you, and they should, this is not them being bad, this is them being good, they're going to want to ask you about toxicology. What's your safety plan? Based on biology of VEGF, what are you most worried about? I'm most worried about bleeding. It's an antibody. I'm most worried about an allergy to the antibody. Did any of the, pa the uh, um, tox studies show allergy to the antibody? 
what are you going to look for and how are you going to look? How often are you going to measure the patient? So the preclinical safety plan is really important and based on what you find in toxicology. The other thing that's essential is, and especially modern oncology, if you have a targeted therapy, you must have a diagnostic. And that is wicked hard because you've got the therapeutic and the diagnostic at the same time. Now, things like CD20, things like VEGF are very ubiquitous. So it's not really targeted in the sense of HER2, um, where we needed a diagnostic. But if you need to have that, we had a what we call the clinical trials assay for Herceptin that wasn't to be marketed. From the moment you guys hit a go decision on, we want to do this, we want to pursue this path, how long until you file the IND? Oh, gosh. It, it, it could be years. It, yeah. it could be two, three years because you're doing animal models. Yeah. You've got now. If you hit the maybe tell folks what the IND is so they understand yeah. why that's an important milestone. So the investigational new drug is asking the Food and Drug Administration permission to ship an unapproved drug across state lines. If if you and I wanted to do something in Austin, um, we could actually do it which is sort of weird when you think about it, but most people don't really want to do that. So we're really going to do the Peter Sue drug. It's going <laughs> to be amazing. We're going to set the lab up right over here. there. But, but to, the moment we want to run a clinical, clinical trial- And ship it. And get it out of the IND, state. You, you yeah. got to have the IND. So the investigational new drug is the request. And what happens is that you bring, take all this information I've been talking about, that, that you know you have a molecule- you, you trust the, the way you're uh, producing the molecule. You, you understand the biology enough. You have a safety plan. You know what's, uh, uh, and you have a phase one protocol. So phase one is, it has one purpose. We're all greedy. I've been there. <laughs> it is only for safety. Phase one is, is it safe to give humans this molecule? Is it safe to give it once? Is it safe to give it multiple times? And there's an art to knowing where to start the dose because it's an escalating dose trial. That's right. But you're extrapolating from what you learned about toxicity in a totally different organism yeah. that never translates one to one to the organism of choice. It's absolutely true. And it's not uncommon. And you see people all the time backing up on the dose, thinking, oh, that was more than we needed um, yep. or more than we wanted. But phase one, um, it, it, with a good preclinical package, a good IND, phase one should be uneventful. Yep. And because we are greedy in oncology, we always look to see if anybody responds <laughs> just because that's what we do. But phase one often, to be fair, has some really tough patients who are trying something and have tried a lot of other things. So the patient population um, uh, can, can be tough to find any efficacy in. Phase two is where things get. So, so phase one, I always think of phase one as it might be a year that you're in phase one if you're doing really And typical good job. cost given the relatively low numbers of patients? Oh, gosh. In the tens of tens millions? Tens of millions, yeah. Yeah, tens of millions. And then you get into the 20s and 30s and 40s of millions with the phase two, depending on how big your phase two is. And phase two, I think, is um, that's where people can use their intellect, I think, in many ways. Phase two, you start to look at what's the right dose and schedule. Um, very, very important to get the right dose and schedule. And what's, what's the right outcome? It, what's the right patient? Who, who do you want to treat? And and really what phase two is supposed to do is, it, with one exception, phase two is supposed to get you ready for phase three. You've got a dose, you've got a schedule, you've got a patient selection criteria, and you've got a hypothesis of where this is going to be a drug. Um, the, the exception in oncology is sometimes you want to get an approval off phase two. Um, when we tested uh, anti-VEGF in breast cancer in phase two, we wanted to use that as an approvable study because mm -hmm. we would go in and say, look, these patients have, it, it can be a contingent approval, but these patients have nothing else to do. Um, and so I think that can happen, especially targeted therapy where you've got the perfect target and FDA is um, feeling good about it too. That can be a phase two study, but most of the time you're getting ready for phase three. So where were you guys with uh, anti-VEGF in phase two? You're at breast cancer and did you do colon? We did colon, but not the kind of study that I just mentioned for approval. Okay. Um, we did a traditional phase two in colon. So what happened is the breast cancer study failed. 
And um, oh, I was so disappointed. I was so hoping <laughs> that that would work. I still remember that day. Um, it, for me, it was like, oh, we need it. We need more better drugs for breast cancer because I often heard from people when Herceptin, you know, when they're the three out of four patients, who Herceptin wasn't for them. Um, if you looked at your stock that day, it also looked really bad because <laughs> all the hype about Avastin um, uh, was there. But in colon cancer, we had a phase two, got ready on the dose and schedule, and then we went to a phase three study in colon cancer, much more traditional, um, just plus plus minus uh, Avastin. Five of you and the usual suspects. And... Five of you and the, the usual suspects plus minus Avastin, and that succeeded. And that was a that was a stage four or stage yeah it was only stage four. Only stage four. And what was the different? This was a this is a median survival study. You're not doing overall survival, correct? That was a median survival study. Actually, I don't remember all the details of that one. The the I feel like it was eight more months of median survival. Does that sound about right? That's probably right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was it was the first new thing in colon cancer for a while too, so people were pretty yeah. excited. Now at this point, I'm in medical school, just <laughs> down the street. I'm at Stanford, and I remember we had a d big discussion about this. I'm in my first year of medical school, and the discussion we had in class was, I think at the time, Avastin was a hundred thousand dollars for the treatment. Extends median survival by whatever, but I think yeah. it was eight months. The UK said no. The NHS said right. we are not paying for this yep. because at the time the NIH, uh, pardon me, the NHS had this one hundred thousand dollar quality adjusted life year hurdle. Yeah. So they were, which is understandable, right? That's yep. how do you throttle supply side economics? They said, look, we can't pay for a drug. We can't pay more than a hundred thousand dollars for an incremental year of quality adjusted life year. This is only giving you eight months. That's why I know it was less than twelve. And so the NHS flatly said we're not paying yep. for this. And I do believe people in the UK could pay out of pocket for it. You can get it out of pocket, but not through the National Health Service. That's right. Yeah. People in Canada could not because you couldn't have private insurance in Canada, though you could come to the US for treatment. And so, of course, this just became a great topic of discussion for yeah. med school yeah. you know, freshmen. Um, what was your thought at the time of, you know, have we yeah. moved the needle enough? How do we think about the economics of this? I had... a a lot of different reactions. First of all, with Avast, and it was the first time I remember reading, and I think it was one of those curtain raiser um, things in the Wall Street Journal for the breast cancer study. It, and the the title of it, the headline was, um, Avastin might help breast cancer patients, but can they afford to take it? And it, I was shocked that it was the first time I had read, and as long as I had been at Genentech, um, that somebody couldn't afford one of our drugs. Like that that instead of saying, oh, isn't that cool? Rituxan, Herceptin, Avastin, it was too much money. And that felt really important to me and really uh, um, not good. Uh, we had as a company a philosophy that no patient should go without any of our drugs because of an inability to pay. So we had a bunch of patient, um, uh, what do you call those, patient support programs or whatever. Yeah. Um, so we had a bunch of different things in place. So I knew we had those programs, but that doesn't help the patients in the UK. And it doesn't help the overall cost because we're actually supplementing, but the cost is still really high. And we started to have a lot more discussion at the executive committee about the price and how we would think about it and how we would price the drugs. Um, because that was, like I say, that was not um, uh, not good.